Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday webinar. This webinar, like all of ours, are being recorded. It will be available on our visitnc365.com site and our partners.visitnc site under the COVID-19 resource section. We will have it up as soon as possible. You can ask questions in the questions tab on the GoToWebinar screen on the right-hand side of your computer. And if you're calling in, you can email your questions to guy.gaster at visitnc.com. We'll answer questions at the end of the program. We've got a great panel here today and lots of uh, interesting things to talk about. Uh, so let's get on to it. Today marks this uh, VisitNC's sixth webinar in the series we've launched and hosted to ensure that we all stay connected, engaged, and informed throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's webinar is all about the art of marketing, making things happen. Through collaboration, communication, and cooperation, we've made significant progress in our preparation toward developing a strong, research-driven recovery plan that resonates with travelers. Remember, we had a Senate group come to us and ask what was the best recovery plan that could be developed. We developed a $20 million plan and submitted it to that group. Now that group went out and lobbied because we don't lobby uh, and we received a $5 million uh, budget so far to do a plan. So as we work to develop that plan, we will not host a webinar next week unless there's a major change in strategy or the COVID situation during that week. We'll come back in two weeks and we'll go over, fully go over our recovery plan. Right now, we are finalizing the research that's gonna help us design and implement this recovery plan, which of course will mostly focus on in-state travelers. Once we delve into that research, we will work on the media outlay and how to spend the funds. Of course, we submitted a $20 million plan. We still hope to run a $20 million plan, but for now, we're gonna go forward with what we have. But before we go forward, I wanna talk about something we're losing. Uh, that something is actually someone, it's Jane Duncan, who I, most of you know, with our agency, LGA. She's on the line now, uh, and she's leaving to go back home to Winston-Salem. We mm -hmm. will truly miss her. Jane has been a heart of the operation, uh, and she's been fantastic working with us for a long time. I remember when she first came, I thought, oh God, we got the intern. Um, it turns out she's really spectacular and has done wonders for us. Uh, one of the things I love about my staff and my team is, is we all love North Carolina. We share this love of the state. We're not just trying to get paychecks. There's a real love of the state, but no one I've ever met has, has a bigger love of her home state than Jane Duncan. Uh, we've seen her grow, we've seen her get married, we've seen her have kids. And now she's off to the next uh, element of her life. So we want to wish her well. Uh, I recommend everybody send her an email. J Duncan, D-U-C-D-U-N-C-A-N <laughs> at thinklga.com uh, and tell her how much we love her and we miss her. And I'm sure we'll see her soon. Um, but Jane, we love you and uh, we'll miss you. And I'm sure you're going to be a rock star, whatever you do. Now that I've embarrassed her, let's talk about where we're going. So the big question we keep getting is, when will people start traveling? Well, here's our latest wave and it's not great news. If you look at it, you can see May, June and July keep having decreases. We even see, have seen some decreases lately in August. So it's looking more like the majority of travel will happen in the fall. Uh, a lot of people just aren't comfortable uh, making those travel plans yet. So we're gonna we're gonna work on that program. We're gonna try and get people traveling as quick as possible, but it continues to look like more and more people are pushing their trips out. What is the distance that they're gonna travel? Well, of course, local travel is gonna start first. Uh, there's people that would be willing to travel, um, you know, about 50 miles right now. Uh, we hope once things start to open up, that'll quickly jump up to where you see the next trip, about a third of the people are willing to go under 200 miles and about less than half would, would go up to 500 miles. Um, so we're really gonna look, focus in state for this and drive market and extremely hyper-local with this uh, original campaign once we get back out because we see that's that's about the limit people are going, willing to go to. What else is on their mind? Well, uh, it's, this recovery is not gonna be just about marketing and how well we can market to people. Uh, it's going to be about safety and making people feel safe. Uh, we see they have a lot of things that they want to make them feel confident that hotels can do. Everything from face masks to cleaning and sanitizing uh, to requiring health screening, 
masks and gloves. Uh, it's a big list. And it's not just for hotels, restaurants as well. Uh, people have a lot of these requests. We'll see on the next slide, we talk about restaurants and what's needed there. So hand sanitizer, cleanliness, disinfectant wipes, employee health screening. Uh, we have Lynn Minges from the North Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association. She's gonna talk about a program we're going to do that's gonna start with restaurants and will eventually spread to the entire um, visitor industry uh, because people really wanna feel safe and we need to, to make sure they feel that way. And the next slide shows what's gonna happen if you don't practice these procedures. Two and three travelers say they're not going to make future purchases with you. They're going to go to your competitor um, and they're going to talk about you in a bad way on social media. So it's really important from what we're seeing from the data from our research is that we need to open in the right way to make people feel comfortable and keep them safe, which makes sense. OK, are they ready to hear a travel message? Well, they're getting a little more ready to hear a travel message but the vast majority of them still aren't ready for it. They're not ready um, to be marketed to yet. Um, this is changing every week, as you can see, but it hasn't changed that much. Now, as states open up, I, I think this is gonna, gonna jump up in the next few weeks and we'll keep an eye on it every week. And we're gonna keep an eye on it specifically with North Carolina residents. Now, here's the, another interesting thing. When I talk about residents, this recovery isn't gonna be just about marketing. And it's not going to be just about visitors and travelers. It's going to be about making people feel safe, not just the visitors. We also need to make those locals feel safe. Right now, as this study shows, many of them are not comfortable with us advertising to bring visitors into their areas. They are just not ready. We hope this will change once things start to open up, but we need to remember it and we need to be careful with it as to how we market. Here's the other part. They don't want visitors coming to their area right now. We need to change this. Obviously, we want people to come. We're known for our hospitality. We can't start marketing, have people come and have the residents not be ready for that. A big key to getting this uh, turned around, I think is the program we're gonna do with NCRLA that Lynn will talk about in a minute to help people get to where we need them to be. There's been a lot of confusion over the phases in the governor's program uh, of how we're opening up. Uh, so I just wanted to go over a few of them really quickly. Uh, with all the fear and apprehension that's out there, a phased approach is really the thing that's gonna help the locals get more comfortable with traveling and travelers to come to the area. Under the first phase, it's important to remember, and the first phase starts Friday, that we are still under a stay at home order. The big change here really is that non-essential businesses can open with some exceptions, but we wanna be careful. We wanna crawl before we walk and we wanna walk before we run. We don't wanna just open the floodgates and have a bunch of people coming in, not ready and businesses not ready to accommodate them in a proper way that keeps them healthy and keeps the people in that area healthy. So we need to be very careful in phase one that it is a limited opening and there's still a stay in place order and nothing changes for restaurants in phase one. If we can get through phase one, the, I think the ideal thing here is we get the residents accustomed to going out in their communities again, make them feel comfortable and get them ready to help uh, to welcome visitors into their areas. Then we get to phase two. Phase two is really where things open up. So the stay at home order will be lifted. That's when we really wanna start the marketing. We wanna get uh, everybody engaged, we wanna make sure people are interested, that restaurants will be opening up. Um, but even at that point, we really need to be cautious in how we do this and make sure it's done in the right way, which will eventually lead us to phase three. Now that's two to three weeks of phase two, which leads us to phase three. So, you know, that's potentially uh, late June when this happens, could be mid June. Um, it's not an easy path to get there. We have to work together. Um, one of the hardest things to do, I think, is going to be to make our residents feel that they can travel safely and that they're comfortable with having people come into their homes, areas to, to visit. You know, like I said, our research shows that two and three travelers say if a travel company doesn't take health considerations seriously, 
they are likely to withhold future purchases. And with, while safety is at the heart of this recovery, there's a pledge, a promise that we're all gonna need to make to each other and to our visitors and have them engage in as well to be able to navigate through and beyond this pandemic. We have that promise. And if we all work together to make it and keep it, the visitors will come back. And now to talk a little about that promise, we have Lynn Minges. She's the president and CEO of the North Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association. She's done yeoman's work to keep things going and to develop this program that I think is gonna be crucial to us getting visitors back in a healthy and safe way. Take it away, Lynn. Thanks so much, Whit, and thank you all for the opportunity to be with you a little bit this morning. It's great to look out and see the names, although I don't see your faces of, of so many people that I love and think dearly of and uh, have had the opportunity to work with through the years. We're certainly in uh, some challenging times right now, and uh, Whit and team, I appreciate the collaboration as we reopen, particularly restaurants and hotels across North Carolina. I would like to point out that uh, currently uh, hotels in North Carolina are not closed. They have remained open during this pandemic. And you've seen some local ordinances that restrict leisure travel. And I think that's still in place in the Asheville area. But most of our coastal, most parts of our coastal region have allowed hotels to, con to continue or to at least accept now um, leisure travelers. So I think we'll begin to see a little bit of leisure travel as people are, you know, a little frustrated being in their homes. They're ready to get out, get to the beaches, the mountains. Um, and some of that travel is uh, encouraging and, and, and encouraged. And so we want to uh, make sure we're doing all we can to, to get folks to feel comfortable as they return. As Whit was going through the phases, he mentioned that in phase two of our state's recovery, um, restaurants and bars will be able to operate at limited capacity. And so I'd like to just share with you a little bit about what that's going to look like going forward. Um, I think we're in daily conversations with the Department of Public Health. Uh, when we talk about limited capacity, what we're seeing around the country is um, with initial openings, they're able to operate at about 25% capacity, which if you think about many restaurants, that's only two or three tables open in a restaurant. It's not a, not a pretty sight. Um, we are hoping that in North Carolina, when we're allowed to open on, on or around uh, May 22nd, could be May 29th, uh, if we're allowed to open then, when we're allowed to open then, we hope that we'll be looking at more like 50% capacity. But even that, if you picture your, you know, picture your favorite restaurant, it, it's not a lot of tables uh, opening. You'll see things like every other booth in a cafe that would be open. And so we're not going to just fling open the doors and get back to business. Uh, it will it will take some time to get back to to normal, or we may never, or may for some time uh, continue at this uh, COVID-19 new normal that we are all hearing about. We will likely see the requirements for PPE, um, waitresses, waiters wearing face masks and maybe even gloves. Uh, you'll see extra cleaning protocols and you will see um, employee screenings taking place before um, each shift. Um, and, and so things are gonna be different. And, and But the one thing we know that Whit mentioned earlier is that we are gonna make, need to make sure that we make customers feel confident and comfortable in coming back into our restaurants. And so with that, we've worked collaboratively, we can go to the next slide, to create a program really designed to help both uh, the employees who work in restaurants as well as the guests feel comfortable in coming back into their, their establishments. Um, we've created the North Carolina Restaurant Promise that we unveiled and shared with Governor Cooper last week. You may have seen that. And it's really our commitment to embracing the highest standards of, of public health and sanitation um, in restaurants across North Carolina as we welcome guests back. As you know, restaurants are already heavily uh, inspected and regulated. Uh, help, we work very closely with local health departments who come in routinely and, and uh, regulate those restaurant operations. That will continue, but the protocols will be much more stringent. And uh, so we are, are, have, have outlined a program for being able to operate at the very highest levels. And we're making a promise to our customers and to our employees that we want to ensure everybody's safety as we welcome guests back into our dining rooms. And we ask that both businesses and guests make a mutual commitment. By partnering together, we can all enjoy great food and we can keep everyone safe. If you think about it, restaurants can only do so much to protect customer service or, or customer safety. We also have to depend on the patrons who come into our establishments for that. So next slide. So what we've done is rolled out uh, the North Carolina prom, uh, Restaurant Promise. And really the first stage of it is 
what restaurants will promise their customers and their employees. We will ensure safe sanitation and best practices are followed. We will administer health checks on all our staff prior to each shift. We'll make sure our indoor and outdoor seating areas meet all physical distancing requirements. We'll have hand sanitizer or hand washing stations at all entrances. We'll clean and sanitize common areas and surfaces regularly. We'll clean and sanitize all tables and hand services after every use. We'll sanitize place settings, utensils, menus, and condiments after every use, or we will ensure that they are single use. And I think we're gonna see a number of restaurants uh, pivoting to single use menus and single use condiments on the table to ensure safety and sanitation. And we'll do everything we can to ensure everyone's safety as we welcome folks back into our dining rooms. And we ask that you, our customers, make the following promises to each other. Next slide. So what are we asking of our customers? We're saying that if you've been recently exposed to COVID-19 or have symptoms of COVID-19, as determined by the CDC, that we would encourage you not to come into our establishments, but to enjoy our good food through delivery and takeout options. If you have underlying health conditions or are part of a high-risk population, uh, we would encourage you to, to uh, not come into our establishments. We want you to be patient and kind to our staff and to other guests and to respect social distancing protocols. And so we're trying to help folks understand that not only do the restaurants and, and ultimately other establishments have a responsibility to you, you have a responsibility to us and to other guests as we move forward together. Next slide. So one of the things we've done is, is work closely with the Department of Public Health to roll out a training curriculum that will be over and above what restaurants across North Carolina already have to adhere to. They all are inspected and in many places you will see the serve safe uh, placard as you walk into those establishments indicating that they have a manager who has been trained at the highest level of food safety. They're already doing that. But to complement and add on to that, we're encouraging restaurant managers across North Carolina to take an additional training curriculum that will allow them to uh, practice the highest levels of uh, public, safe, public health and safety in the COVID-19 era. We're working uh, in partnership with the North Carolina Department of Public Health through a grant to, cre to create this curriculum. We have contracted with Dr. Ben Chapman, who is a renowned um, food safety expert. He's been on the national news during this pandemic and is uh, often seen on uh, talk shows and uh, has participated in a number of the curriculum developments uh, for other organizations like U.S. Travel, like uh, uh, American uh, Hotel and Lodging Association and the National Restaurant Association. He is developing an online training curriculum that's in the development stage now. We'll be releasing courses uh, soon for restaurant managers, back of the house employees and front of the house employees in both uh, English and Spanish. And we will be launching in partnership with Visit and See a, a campaign uh, encouraging restaurateurs as well as hotels, um, especially those that have food service and most do, um, to embrace this training, to take this training. And with that, they would be recognized as embracing and, and going to the highest levels of, um, of standards to ensure public health and safety going forward. And so with that, I will pivot now, I think, to Allison, who's going to tell you more about uh, the campaign and messaging. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Lynn. And good morning to everyone. Um, it's great to be back with you. You know, it is absolutely clear in our data that American travelers have a really strong craving to dine out in restaurants with family and friends. And as you can see on the next slide, you may actually recall from a recent destination analyst research that when travelers were presented with a list of leisure activities and asked to select the first things they were going to do when shelter and place restrictions were lifted. Four in 10 Americans said dining in a restaurant would be among their top five activities. And also from that very same survey two weeks ago, we also learned that seven in 10 American travelers were saying they were doing all that they could um, you know, for their local communities and to support local businesses. But concern about safety really does remain high as Witt and Lynn have just talked about. And it's going to be a determinant as a determinant 
as how successful we are as restaurants begin to open up for business. Now, I would say, Lynn, it is a significant accomplishment on what you and your association has been able to do in such short order uh, to launch this online program for North Carolina with NC State. And it's exciting to be collaborating with NCRLA on the branding and promotion on Count On Me NC. On the next slide, you will see visually that Count On Me NC is a personal pledge, a promise, if you will, as Lynn mentioned, which is advocating a mutual commitment that keeps everyone safe. Now, the name tag that you see is really foundational to the design of this logo, and it's actually interactive. In fact, it's the first logo that I've ever seen that is um, really and truly interactive. It illustrates, honestly, just how personal this is and how it actually means something, that when you say, count on me, it means something when we say it and when we see it. So much so, as Lynn has mentioned, that North Carolina tourism businesses, starting with the restaurants, are willing to put their names on the logo. So you see that first illustration in uh, the name tag, and the second one, you see it as a stamp, which we'll show you later in the presentation, an illustration of that on, let's say, a paper menu. And then uh, the third illustration of the logo is what you might see uh, on a website as a website badge. On the next slide, you see really just how uh, predominantly um, this campaign could be and how it has such a really strong viral component to it, that each restaurant can put their name to it, but also those who work um, at a restaurant, at the front of the line, at the, the back of the house, um, you know, restaurant owners, operators, chefs can wear this sticker, can wear this badge. Um, and, 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 and really wear it proudly to say what this industry is doing to keep their patrons safe. Uh, on the next slide, there's a more permanent application for the name badge. Um, if restaurant workers or those in the tourism um, industry and service providers would want to display that daily, so there's an application of it here. And then on the next slide, as I mentioned earlier, you can see the actual stamp on Count On Me NC on a disposable you know, paper menu. Um, and then on the next slide, I think um, this is certainly a personal favorite of mine. Um, it's uh, printed on a coaster. So it can be there at the bar and help really spur a conversation among patrons on what it means um, and how we have to work and be in this together uh, to make sure that we keep everyone safe. So that's a personal favorite of mine. And then on the final slide, uh, we see it on a t-shirt. And we've got Whit Tuttle here presenting it proudly. And again, restaurant workers could use this as a uniform, or it could be part of um, merchandising in which uh, North Carolinians can, can wear this shirt uh, proudly. And the very last slide shows um, our logo, shows Count On Me NC actually as a window clean, and it's on the doors and, and windows as a decal so that anyone who comes into the restaurant to dine, they will see that this promise, this North Carolina promise is fully enforced. Um, we're working really, really closely with the Restaurant Lodging Association to launch um, a website and we're working closely with our agency LGA who really deserves all the credit here and in putting this incredible logo together. Uh, you can also be assured that our public relations efforts will be in full force to ensure that this message gets out across the state and across the country, um, that travelers uh, who we want to welcome back in North Carolina can count on NC. So moving on to the next slide, I'm really excited to talk about a campaign that's been in the works for quite some time. Um, and it's really uh, the perfect, perfect message for the food obsessed traveler. 
Um, and I really wanted to uh, bring in a quote from Bill Addison, who wagers to guess that there is no Southern road trip itinerary that brings more pleasure than a west to east track um, cross North Carolina to really experience the diverse and distinct and delicious offerings that we offer travelers who come into North Carolina. So I couldn't agree with you more, Bill. So on the next slide, I'm excited to introduce Cook It Forward NC, which is an innovative campaign on Instagram that will shine the light on North Carolina's diverse culinary offerings and landscape while also doing something that I think is really important and is a worthy cause, and that is to financially assist restaurant workers who have been hardest hit and most impacted by COVID-19. So on the next slide, we want to share that visit, uh, I'm sorry, that Cook It Forward NC deploys North Carolina's most acclaimed and award-winning chefs to ignite a chain reaction of goodwill across Instagram. It's gonna, the campaign is gonna be launching next week and our influencers in this campaign are our chefs and they will have an incredible local message that will help drive awareness for our culinary offerings and help those restaurant workers. It, the campaign will also drive Instagram users to visit nc.com, which will be a dedicated landing page, Cook It Forward NC, where they can learn more about the chefs, more about the campaign and make a donation to the North Carolina Restaurant Relief Fund. So next slide. So this is how the campaign works. It is one chef who goes out and post a favorite dish of another chef's creation. In that post, they include the hashtag for the campaign, cook it forward NC, and they link to visit nc.com to the landing page, cook it forward NC, where Instagram users can swipe up, go to the website and learn more about the campaign. Well, then the chef, that was nominated. And as we can see here, it starts with Ashley Christensen, and then she is nominating Joe Kindred. So then Joe Kindred does exactly the same thing. The nominated chef goes out and posts his favorite dish of another renowned chef across North Carolina, and again, encourages them to keep this going, one chef helping another chef, calling attention to our incredible culinary in a pay it forward uh, progression. Baked into the messaging will be the campaign's hashtag, cook it forward and see, which you can see on the next slide, which showcases the landing page I've been talking about um, that is a cur that currently is in design. And this is a mock-up for you so that you'll be able to see it. As you know, Instagram is an application that primarily is um, utilized by mobile. So you can see the mock-up on the mobile design, and then you can see the desktop as well. And front and center, it tells Instagram users and any visitors to the website to follow the campaign, cook it forward and see. And then you can see on the next slide of the landing page that you learn a lot more about our master chefs. Um, in this particular mock-up. And we are going to showcase all culinary offerings and really let um, you know, our chefs take that message home in a, in a strong and altruistic way. Once they are on this page, as I mentioned, you can learn more, users will be able to learn more about how they can donate. Um, they can also buy restaurant cards um, as well. Uh, they can go out and uh, order takeout, or if restaurants are open by this time, they can actually go in and dine in these establishments. On the next slide, you will see a mock-up of how we are sharing information about each of the, slide, uh, each of the chefs. They are gonna provide uh, their go-to pantry items that they utilize every day to help encourage and inspire those food-obsessed enthusiasts how to make some of these dishes at home. 
on the next slide, we can share uh, the next phase of the campaign. Now, a lot of this is going to be based on engagement data and social polls to determine among all of these posts that we accumulate across Instagram from the chefs, which ones were actually the most popular. And then from there, we will ask those chefs to go on Instagram Live, it'll be about five or six of them, will go on Instagram Live and they will actually prepare that dish online. It'll be more of a home-friendly version of that recipe. Um, we're anticipating that uh, these demonstrations will be about 10 to 15 minutes in length. And then uh, from there, we will take those videos and we will uh, utilize them and place them on Instagram TV, a shortened version. And then from there, we will take um, even more of this incredible content and we will push it out as part of uh, paid promotion. So on the next slide, um, as I mentioned, we are putting some paid media behind this. And this is actually exciting because, as you all know, our advertising has been paused since, you know, the middle of March. So we're going to be targeting North Carolinians across the, the state. Uh, they're going to be adults 18 plus. We're going to be really focusing in on those who have an affinity for food, for cooking shows, uh, BuzzFeed Tasty, uh, those who are looking at online recipes and following food bloggers uh, all across North Carolina. Um, and then uh, with these posts, with these branded content, we will spend, I would say, the majority of our budget on boosting those posts uh, that each of our chefs are, you know, taking time out of their busy day to make sure that we can really spread the word. And then the remaining 20% uh, of the budget is going to be boosting organic contact, uh, content and uh, making sure that we are complementing the efforts of each aspect of this campaign. So on the next slide, um, again, I want to say, um, Earn Media is going to be a huge part of this. We are working with our PR team and our PR agency to make sure that North Carolina's uh, exceptional culinary offerings are promoted. Um, it's really going to do everything that we possibly can to ensure that we are rallying support for restaurant workers who, as I've mentioned, have been hardest hit by this pandemic. And then lastly, as Whit was talking about earlier, really demonstrating North Carolina's service-oriented uh, and altruistic nature that really makes our state a premier place to live, work, and visit. All right, on the next slide to, to wrap all of this up that I think um, is really important, our entire discussion has really been about um, safety and about um, what we can do as an industry to make travelers feel safe again. Uh, as we have confronted this pandemic and we have been following these trends, one thing is absolutely for certain. Americans are in agreement about hand sanitizer, disinfectant wipes, and well ex explained cleaning procedures. So the image I'm sharing here is actually really exciting. It's from the New York Times Instagram post. Um, and this post was actually derived from an online story in the New York Times called Street Art Confronts the Pandemic. And it really uh, spotlights street art during this, you know, unprecedented times, depicting murals of masks, hand sanitizers, and a deep, deep appreciation of service providers. Um, our PR team was actually credited with ensuring that one of our artists in North Carolina was featured. It was Charlotte-based artist Darian Fleming, and his mural is called Purell's Gold, uh, which I think is absolutely uh, fabulous. And one of the reasons why Fleming did this is he really wanted to give the community in Charlotte uh, some hope as we go through um, this pandemic and, and nothing that any of us has ever experienced before and, and something to enjoy during these uncertain times. Um, so um, I believe the New York Times has about 8.7 million followers. I think the post was around uh, March 2nd. You can go check it out and like it if you haven't already seen it. 
Um, since we are talking a lot about social, I think it's really important now that uh, I turn over this presentation to Nick Parker, who is uh, Visit NC's digital media strategist. And he was with us a couple of weeks ago on a webinar to um, share some of the really creative uh, ideas we've had to stay really connected in a virtual way um, with our followers um, across social. So he's going to give us an update on that, but he's also going to take us on a little bit of a road trip on how we are celebrating, celebrating National Travel and Tourism Week. So without further ado, Nick, take it away. Thanks, Kat. Uh, and thank you, Allison. So, uh, yeah, happy to talk about some of our social media efforts, especially what we've been doing this week for National Travel and Tourism Week. So on the next slide, you'll see that we jumped in with U.S. Travel's uh, National Travel and Tourism Week, as we do every year, but obviously this year took a bit of a different form. And so their idea was to have a virtual road trip across the country, stopping in every state to highlight some different virtual experiences that were available to visitors these days when we can't unfortunately get out and about and actually go on road trips like this. Uh, so we rode along and participated through the hashtag as well as through some of our own original posts. Uh, US Travel had a lot of great prompts where they asked questions about what the uh, what stop they're most looking forward to, uh, some of the best places to go on a hike. Um, there was a question there about where they prefer uh, donuts or bagels, so you know, hotly contested stuff like that. And then of course they stopped, quote unquote, in North Carolina yesterday around 1 p.m. and we were happy to respond to them there. So this slide and the next one both show you some examples of some of the interactions that we had. And we saw some really great engagement with some of these posts, um, with people chiming in to add their own recommendations or some of their uh, favorite spots or favorite memories. Um, some of the locals got in on even to that uh, re reply tweet from RDU International Airport and their awesome art collection. So really a whole wide variety of things from food to art to uh, even just, uh, you know, really cool pictures of our scenery, as people love to see. And that's been a huge component of what we've been doing uh, in these new times, talking about how we can connect to travelers when they're not able to actually come to our destination. So uh, the social team at LGA has done a terrific job of not only keeping up with all the things that we've been doing on social, but also on kind of diving in and getting some insights that we can hopefully share with y'all to maybe give you a couple of ideas as to what, at least what's been working for us and hopefully what might work for you guys as well. So these are some of our key takeaways from organic social over the past couple of weeks and over the past two months in general. Uh, on Instagram, we've seen that despite what you might think, a lot of the same stuff that has always worked for us has been working well for us. So, uh, you know, that natural scenic beauty that we've always been known for has continued to be our top performing content. Uh, but we've also seen that Instagram stories have had huge engagement over the past few weeks. Uh, people really love that bite-sized snackable content and they like the you know the narratives that you can use through those series of photos and videos and as a result the swipe up feature where people can swipe up to links and to our profile uh, through that story uh, has been a huge valuable tool uh, for us to direct traffic we've seen a lot of different clicks and as a result we feel like people are really getting value out of the stories that we posted uh, so for example we've had some stories that have doubled or tripled even our pre-covid engagement rates um, most notably um, when we talked about some of our virtual experiences or when we deployed our custom Zoom backgrounds, which unfortunately we're not able to use on GoTo webinar, but otherwise we'd be happy to show you some llamas or some hot air ballooning in the mountains. Uh, on Facebook, uh, shout out to Guy in the film office here. Uh, film content has been our most popular recently. Um, you know, with everybody staying in and consuming all that media, it seems that uh, you know sharing some different uh, things that we have to offer from film, especially uh, some of our throwback 90s films there, um, have been really engaging and people have really been telling us how much they've enjoyed it. Um, and then the second top performing post that we had in the last couple of weeks was uh, jumping in on the Merle Fest live stream. The good folks at Merle Fest were awesome enough to uh, stream the entire 2012 uh, concert, all the stages uh, over a weekend a couple of weeks ago. And they were, uh, they saw a lot of really great engagement and a lot of folks tuning in. Um, but what we've found here is that uh, even old content, as long as it's packaged in new original ways, can work really well. You know, we don't have to completely reinvent the wheel for what we're doing these days on social. Um, and speaking of which, on the next slide, um, 
Twitter has actually, you know, it's been our third place platform for a while now, but it's really come on strong in these times. Um, people are turning to it a lot to keep up with the world and they're having a lot of conversations there. And thankfully, given the nature of Twitter, they've actually been fairly positive conversations recently. Uh, so we've seen a lot of great opportunities to engage with those. Um, one that stands out is when uh, DNCR had a photo challenge for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, and that was our top performing Twitter content recently. Um, you can see there it says seven out of 10 of our top posts defined by engagements were related to Earth Day. That's massive. You know, we rarely see uh, that kind of concentrated uh, success for one topic, but people are really leaning into these conversations on Twitter these days. Um, and we've also started doing much more active community management. I think um, Shannon, our social media manager at LGA, would tell you that she's probably tweeted more in the past few weeks since this all started than in the several months combined. And that's great um, because we've seen a lot of increase in engagement. Um, our profile visits have doubled, as you can see there, and our mentions have gone up by almost half, which is a massive increase. And it's just uh, shows you that if you're out there listening to people and engaging with them where they are, uh, they're going to come back to you and they're going to uh, engage with you more. So we're really enjoying those conversations. And they've really been successful for us. Um, so some of, a couple of key overall takeaways from this. Um, original content continues to do better than shares for us. Uh, why is that? Partly it has to do with the algorithms and the way that uh, the different platforms prioritize original content as opposed to shared content. Uh, but also it seems to us that people really look for uh, the brands authentically speaking rather than uh, just sharing somebody else's content. As much as we love sharing all the wonderful things that come to us from all over, uh, it seems that even when we take you know, something that say comes to us from one of y'all and then repackage it ourselves um, in you know, video format while still shouting you out, it does better for people because I think they see that that first person uh, narrative as opposed to a second or third person makes a big difference. And then I already touched on this with Twitter, but across platforms, community management is everything right now. The more that you're listening to people and the more that you're talking to them, the more that you're meeting them where they are and uh, engaging with them, you're going to see huge dividends across your, um, your platform in terms of impressions, engagement. Every metric goes up the more that you're able to talk to people and to have that active conversation with them. You know, it's something we've been trying to do more of in general in the past few years, and especially over these past couple months, uh, it's been hugely important to our efforts. Uh, so as always, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you might have about social, um, but in general, I think we're going to now open it up to those questions you've been submitting during this webinar uh, for everyone to be able to answer. So uh, with that said, uh, Maestro, take it away. All right, everybody. So uh, we've had some questions coming in and uh, we'll bring back some of our panelists and uh, get, get them some answers. So a question, uh, will wineries also be able to participate in the Count on Me NC program? And uh, I can talk about this or Lynn can talk about this. Uh, while the original program is going to be for restaurants, we do, uh, we'll expand it out to everyone at every type of tourism business across the state. So yes, wineries will be able to participate and count on me. Uh, we want everybody to do it. As Lynn said, it's really a pledge between the, the industry and the visitor, uh, both of them in it. And so we're, we're, we will eventually expand that out and have guidelines for attractions, uh, lodgings, the restaurants and, uh, and all other tourism businesses. Okay, second question. In uh, let me go here. Have the chefs already been chosen uh, for the Cook It Forward, and do they represent large and small destinations? Allison, do you want to take that? Absolutely. Um, here's how we're working. You know, since hope is not a strategy, uh, we are initially reaching out with the help of the Restaurant and Lodging Association to communicate with a number of chefs to get this campaign started. But what is critical and what is so important for this to be really successful and altruistic is that from there it takes off. So it covers every county across the state that it can not only um, just feature our James Beard chefs or those who are other award-winning or renowned, but that it can get down to the pitmaster. It can also, um, you know, highlight in an incredible way, you know, the cooks and even those frontline workers. So we're really hoping that the entire industry will jump into this. 
Uh, we will also say that in, in our outreach, we are making sure that we are reaching out to chefs across the state so that we will have representation in those hot spots known for culinary um, to ensure that this gets off. But yes, this campaign really is uh, to be viral um, and to be organic. And so we're just helping get it started. Uh, if there's a chef that you would like to recommend or you want to ensure that we have on our list, please feel free to reach out to me. Great. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, this one for Nick, I think. Are you seeing that more frequency of post is being well received? If so, how often are you posting on Facebook and Twitter? Uh, the old posting frequency question comes up every time. Um, so uh, I'll say the same thing that you've all heard me say many times before, uh, which is I can't tell you how frequently to post on your own platforms because what you know what we do in that regard is entirely informed by our research and by our metrics. So we watch what our audience responds to, and in this case, yes, increased frequency has yielded some benefits, specifically on Twitter, especially. Um, but I can't say that, that holds true across the board, and that will necessarily hold true for you. I think, as always, if you are seeing a you know really strong level of engagement and you feel like posting more might continue that or you know level it up for you, then go for it. If you feel like it's flagging a little bit, maybe you need to back off. Whatever your audience metrics are doing, I mean, we have not quite daily, but definitely weekly conversations with our social team about you know our where our post frequency is at, how much we're doing, and should we be doing more or less. Um, and a lot of it is also just driven by events. You know, we posted way more yesterday than we would on a normal Tuesday, but that was because of National Travel and Tourism Week. So I think letting both the situation and the audience drive your frequency is always going to be the correct strategy. That's great. All right, one for Lynn. Um, how can we get our restaurants to participate in the Count on Me NC program? So I'm glad you asked that question because we're counting on our, I'm glad you asked that question. We're asked, we're counting on our tourism partners across the state to really help get the message out. Um, as I mentioned in the the, um, the layout of the the, uh, unro uh, the unveil of the program, it's in development right now. We expect that early next week we'll have the training uh, ready for restaurants to take. And so at that time, we'll work with WIT and the team at Visit NC uh, to get the message out. We're working with local health departments who are going to help spread the word. We hope that you all will help spread the word to restaurants to participate in it. And it's going to take all of us together. We'll, we'll just rely on every partner we have, Chambers, uh, other organizations who can help connect with restaurateurs to get them to embrace the program. One thing I, I didn't say when I um, when I was speaking and I meant to say is to um, help manage expectations that as we reopen restaurant in dining service, we need to go into it understanding that many restaurants will choose not to open in phase two. And the reason for that is that there is no restaurant in America that's designed to operate at either 25 or 50 percent capacity with table six feet apart. And so we have to respect that and, and understand that. That's their choice. It, it just doesn't work for their business model. And um, so just recognize that going forward that we're going to take baby steps as we get back into this. You know, hopefully some will do some patio dining, um, that kind of thing. But it's going to take us a while. But I think the sooner we can embrace best practices, get people feeling comfortable, um, you know, we'll just do this incrementally as we as we march forward. But uh, appreciate all the help that you all can get in getting restaurants and then ultimately hotels, attractions, wineries, distilleries, breweries, others to embrace the Count on Me and See program. Yeah, and we're really going to rely on on local efforts to to get those restaurants, get those people to participate in it. We can make the greatest programs of all. And if uh, if there's not that local support, they won't, you know, that they're not doing any good. Okay, next question. In the initial advertising, while we understand that a majority of it will be in state, will there also be efforts to market to drivable out of state markets? Yes, I can definitely say most certainly. Um, we will we'll have a big focus in state, which is unusual for us as, as the state tourism office, but we're doing that to help support the local tourism offices that, that don't have the funding. But I think as you saw, about 50% of the people said they'd be willing to drive up to 500 miles. So we'll, we're also gonna hit those contiguous states we think those travelers are going to be comfortable with coming here and we're going to work on them and we're going to eventually try and get back to do this. I think it's also important to, to know that this recovery program, our plan is to run that in addition to running our regular marketing program, which is focused on out-of-state visitors. 
that will still be running. There's co-op available for people to participate in. You can go to partners, partners.visitnc.com to find out about it, but we still will be going after those higher dollar valued out-of-state um, visitors. All right, the next question. What is the timeline so we have time to help with the restaurants coming back? Happy to promote programs in our county, Logos and Chefs. Um, so what is the timeline for rolling this out, Lynn? So we hope that restaurants will be able to open for in-dining service around May 22nd, 29th, somewhere along in there. Um, we will roll out the first wave of this training, hopefully next week. Um, that's ambitious because we've been, you know, there are a lot of partners, a lot of moving parts to this development of the online platforms. Um, but we hope to, to roll this out hopefully late next week into the next week. So there should be time before restaurants open, and that's the goal, for them to take the restaurant manager, front of the house, back of the house training um, in time for that May 22nd, May 28th reopen. Okay. So um, do they need to do the trainings to display the count on me tags? So that is the plan. That is that is the plan is that we are encouraging, particularly on the restaurant side, for them to take the training. I think uh, there will be some, although the training will be available for other attractions, uh, hotels and others, um, it's really, I mean, the core piece that we, we want to uh, engage in this are the restaurants who will have, re restaurants and food service establishments will have much more rigorous requirements and they will be uh, inspected by the health department. So theirs is a, is a higher standard than you're going to see in other, um, in other places. Um, but we do encourage the training. It's 30 minutes online, so it's not a huge responsibility. It teaches the kinds of things that are not intuitive. Um, you know, a few of us have really been trained on COVID-19. We know to wear face masks, but you know that the protocols that we're going to have to embrace going forward to instill consumer confidence are much more stringent. And um, I think this is the time that even a crumb left on a table is going to turn off a, a, a customer who's not going to come back. You know, a ketchup, a, a drop of ketchup that's left on the table is not going to be acceptable. They're going to have to see us visually embracing best practices, wearing face masks, frequently wipe, wiping and washing, maybe putting uh, timestamps on top of tables saying this table was glass cleaned at 10.05 a.m. I mean, some things like that. Those kind of protocols, we're going to have to visually demonstrate. And so I think that's what this training is designed to do is to show that we're just going above and beyond what customers might normally expect to uh to create best practices. So tra the training is an important part of that. Um, and at the end of the training, a restaurant will be able to print out a certificate that you've seen here showing that they've taken the training. They'll be able to sign their name. They'll then get the door clingers, restaurant clingers. They can then use the logo on their um, on their establishment. So it's not a big ask of the restaurateurs to take this training. Um, and I think it'll go a long way toward not only creating customer confidence, but also making sure that they are uh, you know, embracing these very best practices. Great. And now the next question, will there be media supporting the count on me so that customers are aware and maybe looking out for the designation? And yeah, that'll be part of our recovery campaign. You know, I, as I said earlier, this is really going to be about addressing fear in some ways, and we're going to be very delicate in how we do that. We've got to encourage people to feel safe and travel at the same time. So that'll happen, and, and the count on me will be integrated into everything we do, not just the advertising, but also the social media, earned media. Uh, and all that. So it's going to be a big part of this campaign for us. And then Lynn, the uh, question, so in phase two, do we think we'll have 25% or 50% capacity for restaurants? And that's a good question. Uh, that's a real good question. So in our discussions with the Department of Public Health, and I have another meeting today at two o'clock with them to see where they are on all of this, we're asking for 50% as opposed to 25%. Most states that you see opening their in-dining service now are, are at 25. So our hope would be that we could go in, since we're waiting a little bit later, go in at 50% and hopefully increase that capacity. Um, it'll also have a six feet distance requirement too. And so that's gonna be another component, um, but we're, we're, lo we're lobbying for 50. We're trying to get things that we can practically put in place to ensure customer uh, service but uh, and public health but also you know, make these businesses viable. They're struggling right now. And the sooner we can get them back in business, earning yet one more sense of uh, stream of revenue, it'll be helpful. Yeah, and I think we had another question, sort of similar question, how do we encourage our restaurants to participate? I think the main thing is to encourage them that 
this is one thing you can do to help deal with that fear that so many people are going to have about coming back. And if you do this, this will help them address that. Okay, and then one last question. Where did it go? When can we mention the uh, count on knee training? When is that going to kick off, Lynn? I, I think you're fine to go ahead and, and mention that right now. We're with this this right now is the first that we've publicly talked about this. Uh, we've been working on the NC Promise and kind of the back end of this thing. Um, but we really we have not even rolled it out to our restaurants yet. Just trying to make sure that we had it teed up and ready to go. I would encourage you to begin talking about it. Um, I've begun talking about it a little bit, teasing it with the mayors and um, League of Municipalities as I've been talking with them. So folks are beginning to hear about it. Um, we're meeting with uh, local health officials this afternoon as well to talk about it. So I think it's okay to go ahead and talk about it. Just manage expectations that we're, we're it's not rolled out and won't be ready until probably early next week. Yeah, we're, we're kind of building this thing on the fly. Um, Allison, we think we'll have the Count on the NC uh, website up when? <laughs> <laughs> now that's some pressure there, Whit. Um, well, yeah. as, as uh, I can share with uh, the audience that the team met uh, with the agency yesterday and um, it is on a fast track for us to launch. Uh, we're hoping to get something live um, by the time we are in phase two, you know, uh, at the end of the month to be able have to have something that can be both consumer facing and um, represent those restaurants who are signing on and taking that training program. Yeah, so we'll so we'll get it up as soon as possible. Does someone <laughs> have to be a member of NCRLA to participate in Count on Me? No, absolutely not. We're uh, encouraging all restaurants and hotels to participate. Uh, any food service establishment to participate so no membership required in fact we've been helping everybody we don't even look at our membership roster um, there are no paywalls to the work that we're doing we're all in this together and we've got to all come back together to ensure our industry's uh viability so no membership required that's super and of course we'll have more information on this program and the toolkit and where you can get it and how people can apply and how it relates to all the other businesses as well um, as they develop. We're, uh, we're trying to move this out as quickly as possible and it's going to be a big part of the campaign in the future. I think that's all the questions and it's 11 o'clock. So uh, thanks for, for participating and uh, we hope to see you guys in two weeks. Thanks a lot, Lynn. We really appreciate everything you're doing as always. And thanks, thank you, Nick and Allison, for your great work too. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a good week. Bye.